The Tango Tango ambush, or the Niger ambush occurred on October 4, 2017, when armed militants from the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, ISGS, attacked Nigerian and U.S. soldiers outside the village of Tango Tango, Niger, while they were returning to base after a stop in the village. During the ambush, four Nigerians, four U.S. soldiers, and at least 21 ISGS militants were killed, and eight Nigerians and two U.S. soldiers including the team commander were wounded. In the day preceding the ambush, the Nigerian and U.S. soldiers conducted a mission attempting to locate and capture or kill down to Chafo, a commander in the ISGS. The ambush sparked political debate over the presence of U.S. forces in Africa and brought attention to previously underreported U.S. military activities in the region. The ambush also prompted congressional inquiries and an investigation by the U.S. Department of Defense, DOD. The DOD inquiry, completed in 2018, found that the 11-member U.S. Special Forces team was not prepared for the mission and identified other flaws in planning. The ambush remains the largest loss of American lives in combat in Africa since the Battle of Mogadishu in 1993. In January 2013, a senior Nigerian official told Reuters that Baisa Williams, the then United States ambassador to Niger, requested permission to establish a drone base in a meeting with Nigerian President Mohamedou Isufu. On February 5, officials from both Niger and the United States said that the two countries signed a status of forces agreement that allowed the deployment of unarmed surveillance drones. In that month, U.S. President Barack Obama sent 150 military personnel to Niger to set up a surveillance drone operation that would aid France in its counterterrorism efforts in the northern Mali conflict. In October 2015, Niger and the U.S. signed a military agreement committing the two countries to work together in the fight against terrorism. U.S. Army Special Forces personnel, commonly referred to as Green Berets, have deployed on numerous occasions to train personnel of the Niger Armed Forces to assist in the fight against terrorists from neighboring countries. In October 2017, there were about 800 U.S. military personnel in Niger, most of whom were working to build a second drone base for U.S. and French aircraft in Agadez. The expectations were that construction of the base would be completed in 2018, which would allow the U.S. to conduct surveillance operations with the General Atomics MQ-9 Reaper to monitor ISIL insurgents flowing south and other extremists flowing north from the Sahel region. In 2015, the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara was established by Adnan Abu Walid al-Sarawi, who was a spokesperson and senior leader of the Movement for Oneness and Jihad in West Africa, Majao, a splinter group of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. In August 2013, Mujayo merged with Al Murabitown, which swore allegiance to Al Qaeda Amir Ayman al Zawahiri. In May 2015, Sarawi spoke on behalf of Al Murabitown and had pledged his allegiance to the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant and its leader, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. However, the declaration was not recognized by the group's leader, Mokhtar Belmokhtar, and the Al Qaeda loyalists, creating a split in the group. According to the United States Department of Defense, ISIL leaders in Syria had acknowledged Sarawi's allegiance through their AMAC news agency, but ISGS has not been formally recognized as an official branch of ISIL. The ISGS's first confirmed terror attack occurred on September 2, 2016 when fighters targeted a customs post in Markoy, Burkina Faso, an attack that left a border agent and a civilian dead. The ISGS had since been targeting pro-government militias that support the French and United Nations forces in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. According to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, at least 46 attacks occurred since early 2016 in the Tahua and Talabri regions of Niger. OCHA also said that seven districts in the two regions had been under a state of emergency since March 2017 and the government renewed the measure for an additional three months on September 18. The FAN had launched a military operation to re-establish security in Talabri in June 2017.
On October 2, 2017, a U.S. Special Forces team received intelligence that a high-value subcommander of the ISGS was in their area of responsibility. The next day, the team submitted a mission plan to locate and capture or kill the subcommander, but inaccurately described it as civil-slash-military reconnaissance. The mission plan was approved, and on October 3rd, the team of 11 personnel, including eight U.S. Special Forces operators, two support, and an intelligence contractor, along with 35 Nigerian personnel from the Security and Intelligence Battalion and the 433rd Special Interdiction Unit, departed towards the vicinity of Tailoa in an eight-vehicle convo. The Americans traveled in two technicals and an unarmored Toyota Land Cruiser, while the Nigerians traveled in five vehicles, one of which was provided by the CIA and had specialized surveillance equipment on board. In Tailoa, on October 3, 2017, a team of 11 personnel consisting of eight U.S. Special Forces operators, two support, and an intelligence contractor, along with 35 Nigerian personnel from the Security and Intelligence Battalion, Battalion Securite ET de Rensainment or BSR, and the 433rd Special Interdiction Unit, departed toward the vicinity of Tailoa in an eight-vehicle convoy to locate and capture or, if necessary, kill a high-value ISGS subcommander. The Americans traveled in two technicals and an unarmored Toyota Land Cruiser, while the Nigerians traveled in five vehicles, one of which had been provided by the Central Intelligence Agency and had specialized surveillance equipment on board. After failing to locate the ISGS commander in Tailoa, the team received time-sensitive intelligence that placed the commander northwest of Tailoa at the Mali border. The approved mission plan originally called for a helicopter team as the primary force with the Qualam team serving as a quick reaction force. But bad weather forced the helicopter team to cancel, so Team Qualam continued on their own. They made their movement north through the night of the 4th and reached the objective officials referred to as Objective North at sunrise. As the team searched for the ISGS commander, they discovered enemy rations, uniforms, and a motorcycle which were destroyed by partner Nigerian soldiers. After the completion of the second mission, the team was ordered to return to base. Before returning, the team commander ordered an overhead ISR asset to continue monitoring the area to gather intelligence on possible enemy routes leading into Mali. The team departed toward Tango Tango at 8.30 a.m. local time, leaving them unwatched. On October 4, 2017, a video was recorded before the ambush in which young men armed with rifles and machine guns were seen on motorbikes, repeating Islamist slogans and discussing what they would do if they captured soldiers, with one of them saying that they would decapitate them. At 10.30 a.m., local time, on the same day, the convoy stopped at the village of Tango Tango for partner Nigerians to eat breakfast and get water. During this, team members met with local leaders and 27 men of the village. The U.S. and Nigerian team leaders objected to the task because they were not heavily armed or equipped for intense combat should they encounter Shafu's ISIS fighters alone. But the team leaders' concerns were overruled by a higher command. The U.S. soldiers were divided into two groups, one that would stay back and guard the vehicles and another that would attend the meeting. However, the meeting dragged on with the local leaders delaying the soldiers' departure by stalling and keeping them waiting. The group guarding the vehicles began to suspect that something was wrong when they witnessed two motorcycles race out of the village. The team believed the local leader was complicit in an impending attack. After the completion of the meeting, the soldiers walked back to the rest of the unit and their unarmored pickup trucks. The meeting lasted 30 minutes longer than the team leader expected. The eight-vehicle convoy departed from the village at 11.35 a.m. on their planned route back to base. About 100 meters outside the village, armed militants believed to be led by Don Duchefo, a lieutenant in the ISGS, began their assault against the rear of the convoy. The militants arrived with a dozen technicals and about 20 motorcycles and were equipped with small arms, vehicle-mounted heavy machine guns, rocket-propelled grenades, and mortars. They allowed the convoy to move through the kill zone before attacking, trapping the rear of the convoy. 
the convoy halted as the enemy force mounted and advanced through the tree line. The team reported enemy contact and immediately returned fire using vehicle-mounted M240 machine guns. While the rest of the team dismounted from their vehicles, donned protective equipment, and began to exchange small arms fire. The team leader and four Nigerian soldiers moved to the southeast to flank what was thought to be a small enemy force, while the team sergeant ordered the rear U.S. vehicle to the middle of the convoy to better coordinate machine gun fire with U.S. Vehicle 1. During this time, the rear Nigerian vehicle departed the area by an unknown route. The team leader and the four Nigerian soldiers continued their flanking movement until they were stopped by a body of water, at which point they identified and engaged the enemy across the water, killing approximately four combatants. The team leader observed a larger enemy force moving from his east consisting of armed men on motorcycles and vehicles with mounted machine guns. The team leader returned to the halted convoy at 11.57 a.m. and ordered the convoy to head south to prevent getting outflanked. Members of Team Qualum killed several enemies during this movement out of the ambush site. Niger Vehicles 1 and 2 were the first vehicles to depart. A team member threw a smoke grenade to conceal the team's movement south to regroup with the Nigerians. Team members last saw Staff Sergeants Brian Black, Jeremiah Johnson, and Dustin Wright taking cover behind the team's unarmored SUV. Wright got in the SUV and began to slowly drive south while Black and Jeremiah Johnson ran alongside, continuing suppressive fire at the enemy while under heavy fire. After passing the colored smoke, Black ran and took cover behind a nearby tree while Jeremiah Johnson fired over the hood of the vehicle towards the tree line. As they continued their movement towards the south under fire, Jeremiah Johnson fell to the ground, leaving him exposed to enemy fire. Wright immediately backed up the SUV to bring him into cover. Simultaneously, Black was slightly ahead of the SUV and was hit by small arms fire, killing him instantly. Jeremiah Johnson regained his footing and ran to Black, checking for wounds. Wright exited the halted vehicle, looked toward the enemy, and then dragged Black into cover. The two remained with Black's body and further assessed his wounds. Eventually, as enemy combatants pushed forward, they hastily abandoned their position. Approximately 85 meters, 93 yards, southwest of the SUV, Jeremiah Johnson was hit by enemy fire and collapsed. Wright stopped running and returned to Jeremiah Johnson's position. Wright continued to engage the enemy until incapacitated by enemy fire. Wright and Jeremiah Johnson were shot multiple times at close range by the militants, killing them. After initially escaping the ambush site, the American and Nigerian forces established a secondary position. Upon realizing Black, Jeremiah Johnson, and Wright were missing, two team members volunteered to head back to the ambush site in an attempt to locate Vehicle 3. As they advanced toward the ambush site they engaged and killed several militants before retreating to a safe position due to overwhelming fire. At this point two additional team members would head back toward the initial ambush site to help locate the missing teammates. At the secondary position the remaining team members and partner forces were becoming overwhelmed by enemy fire and were forced to enter their vehicles and egress out of the area at a high speed. During this maneuver, Sergeant Law David Johnson and two Nigerian soldiers became separated from the rest of his team. Believing he had successfully re-entered his vehicle, the other vehicles had left the area. La David Johnson was unable to enter his vehicle due to concentrated enemy fire and was forced to escape and evade on foot with the two Nigerians. Both Nigerian soldiers were killed by enemy fire as La David continued sprinting through the open desert. Approximately 960 meters, 1,050 yards, from the initial ambush site, La David took cover under a dense thorny tree and engaged the encroaching enemy. Soon after, a vehicle with a mounted machine gun stopped within 100 meters, 110 yards, of La David Johnson's position and pinned him down. La David Johnson was killed by small arms between 12.30 and 12.45 p.m. Initial reports indicated that La David Johnson may have been captured and executed, but he was found laying on his back with his arms by his sides and had wounds consistent with sporadic fire while he actively engaged the enemy. As the main operational detachment Alpha, ODA, element attempted to evade enemy forces, 
They came under heavy fire which resulted in one Nigerian soldier killed while the team leader and team sergeant would suffer multiple gunshot wounds. During this sustained attack the ODA leader was thrown from the bed of the team's pickup. The team circled the area and recovered the injured team leader. At this point the team's vehicle became bogged down and unable to continue. The four team members who split from the second position would regroup with the remainder of the team and partner force. Under heavy fire, seven American and four Nigerian soldiers would run through the wooded area and break contact with the enemy. They would establish a perimeter and began treating the wounded. The team radioed in that they were being overrun, then destroyed their radios to avoid them getting in the hands of the enemy. They sent final messages to loved ones on personal devices and prepared for the worst. Team members would observe Nigerian soldiers on the ground praying. The first call for additional support was relayed by the U.S. forces nearly an hour after they first came under fire. Within minutes, an unarmed U.S. drone captured video of the firefight. French Mirage jets were ordered to respond to the ambush, and they arrived roughly 30 minutes after notification. Even though there was now air support, the French pilots could not engage because they could not readily identify enemy forces in the firefight. Nevertheless, the presence of the fighter jets brought the engagement to an end. Two French Super Puma helicopters were brought in from Mali to evacuate the injured Nigerians and Americans, while Barry Aviation, an independent contractor, evacuated the bodies of the fallen U.S. soldiers. Within three to four hours after the soldiers called in for support, a French special operations team arrived at the scene. When the soldiers were found, one U.S. soldier was found lying next to an enemy pickup truck while two other U.S. soldiers were found in the bed of the pickup. All soldiers had their serviceable equipment, including their body armor and boots taken from them. Footage taken from Jeremiah Johnson's helmet camera was later posted online which showed the engagement and subsequent deaths of the soldiers. On October 6, the body of Law David Johnson was found by children tending cattle. His body was nearly 1.5 kilometers, one mile, away from the scene of the ambush. On November 12, additional remains of La David Johnson were found at the site where his body was recovered. All soldiers showed wounds consistent with small arms fire and had received additional bursts of fire at close range. All deaths were considered either instantly fatal or rapidly fatal. In October 2017, Defense Secretary James Mattis described the ambush as considered unlikely. The Department of Defense officials stated that 29 similar operations had been carried out in the past six months with no issues and that such operations were routine at the time of the ambush. General Joseph Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, provided new information about the ambush, revealing that the operation was initially a reconnaissance mission. In December 2017, Major General Mark Hicks, the commander of Special Operations Command, Africa, Socafrica, wrote a letter emphasizing the need to reduce risk exposure and build trust in the ability to exercise sound judgment and disciplined planning and execution. On May 10, 2018, the U.S. Department of Defense released an unclassified executive summary of the DOD's investigation, which found that personnel turnover had caused the 11-member U.S. Special Forces team to forego important training before deployment and that the team did not rehearse the mission. The investigation also found that two junior officers had mischaracterized the mission in planning documents. The report did not provide specific recommendations for handling future missions. Some within the U.S. military criticized the report for downplaying blame for senior officers who had approved the mission 